Well, this is Pete Law, Chair of the Conservation Commission. We're opening up the meeting uh, tonight on May 11, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. And the meeting is being held remote on Zoom. Uh, this meeting will be held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access in accordance with House Bill Number 58 of the 193rd General Court, which extended the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, MGL Chapter 30A, Section 20, until March 31, 2025. Um, and everything, uh, all the remote connections have been listed on the website. So it looks like we're good to go. So the <clears throat> meeting is called to order. Uh, the meeting guidelines. Um, and these are the uh, uh, following the Deerfield Code of Conduct. Please speak one at a time. Be respectful. Be considerate. Courteous. Concise. And non-repetitive. And I would ask also that you address the chair with questions. Um, and then also, if you're not doing a presentation, keep uh, comments and questions to a, a two to three minute time frame uh, as well. So let me uh, identify the members of the commission here this evening. Do I have Kate Devlin? Kate Devlin here. And uh, Sean Libby. Sean Libby here. Uh, ben Byrne. Ben Byrne here. Yeah, and Pete Law here. So we have all four members. Great, thank you much. Um, next item on the agenda is to review the minutes of uh, May 4th meeting. Um, I'm going to ask that we hold off on that until our next schedule meeting on the 25th, as I just haven't had enough time to review all the details. Um, if that's acceptable to the other commissioners, we can postpone that to our next meeting. Do you want a motion? No. Cool. <laughs> Good. We'll wait till that one. Um, there's no new business tonight. Um, there's two areas of old business um, that we run into right now. Uh, the first one is um, the 88 Old Main Street hearing continuation uh, from last week. Um, this is um, to consider a request for a request for a RDA filed by the town of Deerfield. Uh, looking at submitted plans for multiple locations along Main Street. Um, and I think we have Chris Nolan here tonight as the representative of the applicant. Um, Chris, we talked last week and we did get clarification from the DEP um, on this. So the RDA that's that has been submitted that is fairly extensive, um, but you're going to explain in a minute how limited that is. I'm, I'm going to look for some of the specifics on that, um, but we're able to um, you know, review the RDA and, and change appropriately um, and make a decision on that tonight. So we don't have to start all over. So um, sure. much, yeah, yeah, good news. That's excellent news. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so why don't you go ahead, Chris? And one of the things that, you know, we have your RDA in front of us, um, and this is for uh, the placement of uh, one of the tree boxes. Uh, but the, the initial RDA was for, I think, upwards of five or six of them. Um, so could you explain just which one we're looking at and how we're going to clarify the RDA and, and move ahead there? Sure. So I will share my screen right now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can everybody see that? I got it. All right. So this is the picture of the tree box that is being implemented with this RDA application. Um, it is the one that is on the westbound side, or the west side, rather, of Old Main Street, uh, right in front of the existing building right here at 81 Old Main Street, which is the Deerfield Inn. Um, the others listed as alternative locations were all across the street, along with the rain garden, which has been put on hold for the sake of this project, uh, and probably to be returned to with a future MVP application. Um, this is right on a corner where um, 
There's a curb with grass and sidewalk on the other side and the road on the other side of it. So um, the tree box is right here. Um, last week I was ready to go with a street view picture as well, but I don't have that pulled up right now. Um, but it's, we've confirmed it's over, I believe 150 feet from the nearest wetland, which was over adjacent to the visitor center, um, where close to where the rain garden was going to be. And I believe that there will be alternative locations for that considered in the future. But as for now, we are just looking for a negative determination that this tree box uh, in its location on Old Main Street in front of the Deerfield Inn uh, would not be of disturbance. Yeah, and just to be clear, uh, we have a number of drawings from EBI on all the different proposed ones. But this is the one, and there's no, I'm sorry, there's no heading or title on this um, specific sheet. Um, yeah, I personally wish they had made them a little bit more clear. Um, so this is... This would be the fifth one? Yes, it's the one right before, um, yeah, I guess the second to last one. <laughs> Um, I may have a, a different listing because I have you on the fifth and I don't see that second before the last. Oh, there it is again. Uh, I guess I have two copies of it. Okay. So this would be the ones, everybody and commissioners, I hope you have uh, copies in front of you, but be the one that's and listing with the existing building of the Deerfield Inn on the upper side, left-hand side of the sheet. Um, there's no other really way to, to really tell um, what it is, but it's, it's up on the screen now. So this would be the only one that would be requested. So that would be the, um, the change to the RDA that you're looking for at this point. Uh, correct. Okay. So let me go to the RDA. Do, do, do. Uh, it looks like we actually have uh, President John Davis from Historic Deerfield on this call right now. Um, and he has his oh, hand raised. Oh, good. Yep. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Mr. Davis, please. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for considering this. I, I just had one thing to add to what's already been said. I mean, well, two things. First of all, Historic Deerfield is really excited about this, and we're thrilled the town is going forward. Um, and we hope that the rain garden might be a part of um, you know, uh, the town's plans in the future. But for this particular box, when we met with the other Chris, we asked for one minor change, which is that it would be located about 12 feet to the north, because we're very fearful that snow plowing would um, adversely affect the tree in this box, uh, and that you know, basically there's no place for us to plow snow except right where this is located. And at the time, Chris seemed to think that moving it about 12 feet to the north would, would not compromise its ability to, to do what we want it to. So I just thought I would mention that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. So I definitely appreciate the update. Um, and so this will the... be moved 12 feet to the northerly direction. Right. Okay. Okay, so I think I understand. Um, excuse me, allergy seasons. Um, uh, let's see. What we got? Let's see. Anything else from the applicants? 
No, I appreciate your patience and flexibility with this project. Uh, obviously, there were a lot of different people putting it together, and um, we did our best to make sure that we were all on the same page, but I know that there were some changes in plans, and um, yeah, I appreciate everybody's time. Yeah, no, no problem. Things change, for sure. Sure. Um, so I think... Um, as we look at this and I look at the um, information we have from uh, Mark Simpson at DEP, we can alter this RDA. Um, I think we can go ahead because it's outside of the, um, I think it's within the BWV, but outside of the jurisdiction here. Um, but we can go ahead with a uh, form two um, negative condition uh, um, or negative finding termination um but that we'd condition it that it would be only the tree one tree box discussed this evening and i have no uh, maybe you call it the one across from the the deerfield end because there's the project sheets are are not something i could relate back to but um that one and that you will submit uh, before construction uh, the new updated design, just so we know where the exact location would be. So those would be kind of my considerations. Uh, so any comments back from the applicants? No, that sounds reasonable. Um, okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, comments from the commissioners? I'm sorry, I don't have my screen all the way up. Um, so I'm not sure if that's somebody has their hand up or not, but I don't hear anything or see anything. Um, so I take that as a no. So I would accept a, um, a motion to, you know, to proceed with a negative uh, three determination um, on this RDA, um, specifying two conditions that um, we only accept the ones that are the the tree box um, plan that has been discussed tonight, presented tonight, and that would be located across from the Deerfield Inn. And secondly, that um, the applicant would submit the uh, the new plans for, you know, moving that slightly uh, 12 feet north. So somebody's got to, would put a motion together, that'd be great. I would uh, make a motion to um, find a negative three determination for the RDA requested at 88 Old Main Street uh, for the tree box discussed tonight, located north of 81 Old Main Street, Deerfield Inn. Um, and with the revised plan showing the new location um, being submitted prior to approval. Sounds fine. Do I have a second on the motion? Kate Devon. Ben Byrne, I'll second. <laughs> Beat you out, Kate. All right. There's a, a second motion on the table. Any other comments from the commissioners? No. Okay. We'll take a, a roll call vote on accepting that motion that on the table. Uh, Kate Devlin. Kate Devlin, aye. Sean Libby. Sean Libby, aye. Ben Byrne. Ben Byrne, aye. Uh, Pete Law, aye. So the motion passes and, um, you know, um, Chris and John, we'll get you the, uh, we'll get you the uh, paperwork out there and you get us back some of the, uh, the updated, um, the plans and uh, we should be good to go. Awesome. Thank all you right. all very much. We really appreciate it and I hope you have a great night. All right. Good luck to you guys. Thank you. All right, let me just get to my other screen over here. I know what like I'm doing. Okay. Um, so that one's set. And the next uh, order of business this evening is the hearing continuation for sunny days. Um, Relative to the uh, notice of intent, 
uh, for construction of a cannabis cultivation campus, including three buildings, access drive, parking, utilities, drainage system on the property at Zero Greenfield Road, uh, identified in the assessor's record as map 159, lot 14. So we can uh, move on to that discussion. Um, I would say right off the bat, just to let everybody know, we have everybody on the, do we, would we have somebody, oh, Lucy's here, okay, um, from Berkshire Design. I did receive, and I think the commissioners received some information today. Um, I was away most of the day, so I just started reading it a, a few hours ago um, from Berkshire Design Group, some of the peer review summary. Um, I did not receive anything from VHB. Uh, on our last meeting, I had requested to both groups that everybody consolidate and everything so that we could really look at this and and um, and have some uh, information in front of us before the meeting tonight. So I didn't get it uh, or I got it late. Um, so it may mean that our discussions will take a, a while tonight. Um, and I hope it doesn't extend the hearing for another date, but um, we need to go through this. And um, and I appreciate what I did receive, um, but I was, um, we got some stuff kind of late, so we'll have to work through it. So um, applicant, um, Ken, uh, John, uh, who would like to proceed? I guess uh, I'll start, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, John Furman, the office manager for uh, VHB. And uh, with me is uh, the applicant, uh, Ken Boquillen from uh, Sunny Days, and David Picard from uh, uh, Ecological Resource Consultant, who is our environmental person on this. So uh, the summary you gave uh, is is accurate. Uh, we uh, received, uh, I think, um, the, the same strategy from um, Berkshire Design was used on the planning board meeting, which we had on Monday, which I, I believe you attended uh, a part of, is that uh, because of the volume of comments and the back and forth between the two firms, we basically put together uh, a summary letter that highlighted just the, re the remaining items. Um, after I get through speaking, what may make sense is to have Lucy go through those, similar to the way Chris did at the planning board, and then we have a chance to respond to those and uh, provide any information that, that the board may need. Uh, where we are for the rest of the, the commission members um, is that uh, the planning board did issue us approval uh, on Monday. The, uh, uh, the, the letter that uh, Chris um, uh, Chamberlain gave from Berkshire Design is very similar to the one that Lucy has provided to, uh, today to, to go over some of the issues uh, are the, are the same. Um, we uh, we are hoping that we can close tonight, uh, so uh, we'll do our best. And uh, time is no uh, issue for us. We can stay here as long as you can manage to keep your eyelids open. And the um, uh, from the Mass DOT perspective, we've had communications with them. The permits are in, uh, and they're advancing through the stage. So uh, we are we are generally ready to to move forward on this. So. Um, uh, we did not respond to the letter. I didn't want to uh, put together another letter to, that would basically generate another letter from Berkshire Design, uh, particularly when it was so close to the meeting date. So we are prepared to talk about any of those and to offer any information that uh, that you may need. Right. Yeah, so, I appreciate uh, that, John. It was just um, the request was to 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 you all to work with Berkshire Design and to provide us with one consolidated document that you guys kind of work through it and agreed to. Um, but that's okay. We can work through it. Yep. Yeah. And so I think we're we're ready to go. I mean we really the the issues that are listed in in Berkshire's letter are really the only ones that are outstanding. And as we go through those, the same issues uh, were very close to them were brought up to the planning board and they were uh, put together as conditions of approval to address. So we're hoping that we can get to the same point with the commission tonight. So Ken, Dave, I don't know if there's anything you want to have for opening remarks, but um, I'm just prepared to let Lucy kind of read through that letter. All right, hearing none. Ready okay. to go, John. Uh, Lucy, 
Which letter is it? Because I have so, two different uh, ones, May 2nd, May 5th. It's, it's May, it, it was, it was, at, it was May Tuesday, sent out on Tuesday, May 9th. Should I okay. share the letter or just uh, give you the highlights? Uh, I think the commissioners have it in their meeting packet. Okay. Um, yep. So I think you can just kind of go through. Um, okay. I think I'll there was the eight, or, eight or nine, six or seven items, something like that. Seven, yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Please okay. uh, go ahead. Um, hold on. I just haven't found the right letter. And I'm so, taking up tonight, so I need to know. It's uh, yeah. May, May 9th. Uh, on the top, it's in with our letterhead, Berkshire Design Group. Okay. It's the last couple pages of the beating packet, I think, Kate. Okay, thank you. Do you have it? Yeah, great. okay, yes. great. Um, so great, so Lucy, uh, please uh, okay. proceed. Uh, yep. So the first comment is about the erosion and sediment control, and we've been through this. Um, basically, the plans now show perimeter controls, uh, we feel there should be more erosion and sediment control measures and maybe uh, some phasing, but the applicant would like to uh, postpone that to the SWIP, the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan. And um, and, and I think every uh, the, the planning board was, was fine with that. And um, so we recommend that prior to issuing the building permit, the applicant provide the SWIP to, to you, and that um, in, in our opinion, the SWIP should include either phasing of the construction to limit the extent of the land, land disturbed at one time, or uh, additional erosion control measures like sediment traps, diversion swales to those sediment traps, and um, topsoil stockpile locations, dewatering, um, uh, all, all of those things should be included in the SWIP. Uh, so that's comment one. Comment two was on the tree planting. Um, maybe we want to look at it uh, individual uh, comments. Sure. Uh, for comments back from the commissioners, because I um, uh, and for the applicants to see if they have an agreement that because I do have comments on each one of these, so it might just instead of going back and forth, would that work for you? It sure. works. Uh, yeah. Let me, if I could, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll jump in. Uh, so uh, that was uh, a, a great summary, uh, and that's exactly what we agreed to uh, with the, uh, the the planning board. Um, since I think we last met, uh, both Ken and myself have become uh, passed the EPA uh, exam for becoming uh, erosion and sediment control inspectors, and um, we are able to manage that site. So we felt it was important that both of us become inspectors. And certified so that if one of us isn't available, the other one can um, can take uh, take lead on it. The stormwater pollution prevention plan is is an important document. I think I explained it uh, at the last meeting. Uh, we have a template that's very thorough and follows the EPA uh, guidelines uh, section by section, and provides information for the contractor and all the operators of the of the site to follow. One of the items that has to be included uh, in this, um, which uh, is uh, an item for the operator, is a schedule and a site map. Uh, so, <clears throat> so what we, <clears throat> excuse me, what we do is we put in a reduced copy of our site plan and then the operator, as he's uh, working through it, annotates that and then adds to it um, and makes changes as it goes. So we have absolutely no problem in providing that uh, before building permit. We're in the process of preparing that right now, and uh, it'll be available uh, very soon once we get some information on uh, from Mass Historic and uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife to include as appendices in that document. <clears throat> okay. Um, great. Anything else from the applicant? No. Any questions from the commissioners? Okay, I don't hear anything. So, um, yeah, I would have preferred to see a phased plan up front, but I know you described what's in the SWEP and what's going to be in there. So the request and the condition would be that um, the SWEP be provided to the commissions. Um, for review and for approval 
before construction. And that, so you know that it may, depending on, I know you, it could be a, a good long one, um, but depending on what's in there, may have to go out for peer review um, for um, our input, but we need to receive it before and approve it before construction. I don't, I don't think uh, uh, receiving it before construction uh, is a problem. Receiving it and waiting for approval. Okay. And are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with it. Um, just wondering why, Pete, this would have to go out for third party review. Um, you guys are going to obviously look at that. It's going to be very detailed. There's really only two phases of that um, the initial crossing to get our staging area, and then the second session, the second part where we um, where we start construction on this project. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely we're fine with. Um, so we're obviously going to submit it before we get a building permit. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll definitely give you guys time to look over it. Um, but I'm not really sure why we would spend more money and have to have another third party review when the board can take a look at it. Well, in that we don't know what we're going to look at yet. So we don't know yeah. what we're going to receive. And so that's just, a, you know, something, an option that we're going to have to hold out there because we don't know okay. what it's going to look like. Okay, that's fine. So if it's straightforward and, and good to go. We're good to go, but if there's a lot more questions raised, and then it may be beyond my uh, my pay level, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah, we're good with that. Understood. Appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, no problem. Um. Okay, uh, Lucy, does that that's answer your the question comment, there? On the yeah. comment number two. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so comment number two was about the tree plantings and the seeding. And um, so this, there's a seed mix for restoration um, that was identified. And um, I think you wanted to see that added to the plans. Um, I don't know if that was done. Um, but with regards to the tree plantings, um, in our opinion, additional tree plantings uh, would minimize the thermal effects of the development of the buffer zone. So uh, we would recommend that the commission determine whether um, the proposed plantings, which are 12 birch trees, are adequate or to require uh, additional shade tree plantings um, as a condition. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, any input from uh, John? Or yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, David? So any? the... Uh... Uh, the same comment was basically brought up at, at planning, and uh, as I'm, I'm sure the commission is is aware, the the planning board has a uh, an actual uh, uh, ordinance regarding tree removal and, and replacement trees, and we provided uh, information uh, to them, basically uh, responding back to the number of trees that fell into their replacement policy, which was basically 26 trees. Uh, out of the 4.8 acres that we are uh, we are, are clearing, uh, we proposed uh, 12 uh, tri-stem birch trees scattered through the site, which are a two and a half to three inch caliper. So they're a fairly large tree. They're not just a twig. And, I, and when you couple that with the, the woodland setting that we are leaving on the remaining 28 acres, uh, we feel it's, it's adequate for uh, what we're developing. We have uh, condensed the development as much as possible. The, the wetland courses that are there already have constrained the site and we work within them. Um, and we've only impacted wetlands where we needed to, to basically have crossings. Um, David mentioned uh, at the uh, last meeting, I believe that the, the seed mix in addition to what they want to use is on the outside of the uh, the, the tension basin uh, actually is uh, is intended to return those perimeter areas to a, a woodland uh, setting uh, over time. And uh, Dave had given a um, an example of what the uh, the species are within that that uh, seed mix. The planning board only had one request on that was that David had mentioned uh, sumac in that mix and they said they really weren't crazy about that.
but the seed mix is custom so we can actually pull that out and have something else um, added to it. So we've put these 12 trees where they make sense. Uh, we have very limited areas on planters uh, throughout the parking area. Uh, you know, uh, we the with that with the uh, the seed mix that's being put on the outside of all the detention basin walls, uh, we feel is adequate for what we're planting. If I yeah, could I was, just, yeah. I could just uh, tag on a little bit. Um, yeah. So an updated planting plan is going to be provided to the planning board once the additional tests for final sizing of the detention basins is done. And that can also be provided to you folks. And we can show where that restoration mix is going to be proposed. Uh, and then I'd also just like to point out that the wetland replacement area actually has, uh, do the math here, 20 trees proposed, but all two inch calipers. And uh, excuse me, additional 12 trees, all two inch caliper, red maple and Fraxinus Pennsylvanica. So you will get some diversity with those plantings as well when the replication area is quite close to one of the developed areas. So when the trees mature, you'll get some heat mitigation from those. All right, so yes, uh, please send that uh, along um, with your planting plan when you've sent it to the uh, planning board, please. Um, any questions uh, from the, or any anything more input from the applicants? No. Okay, uh, from Berkshire Design. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that this comment was meant as a thermal uh, impact measure because that was commented on by, uh, by DEP. So it really wasn't um, in the same vein as the, the planning board comment, which was more of a landscaping situation. So um, we were uh, looking to uh, address the thermal impacts. And David, you mentioned that some of the trees over one or more of the uh, detention ponds or detention areas would provide shade for the thermal area. Yeah, for once, the thermal concern. Yeah, once once they uh, mature, they're going to cover provide shade over one of the uh, access roads, and also that uh, you know. Um, roadside matrix mix that we're proposing along the edges of the de detention basins. You now that's have shrubs that get up to 12, 15 feet high and those will also provide shade as well. And I would ask uh, Sean as our, <laughs> as our forestry expert here on the, on the commission, yeah, what just... your thoughts on the mix and things? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> What are the species of birches, uh, tri-stem birch trees? Maybe that's, you know, more a landscape thing. It's, you know, are they paper birch, sweet birch, gray birch? River, river birch. birch. River. All right. Yeah, I'm never, I'm never a huge fan of birch trees, um, but, um, you know, they're, uh, it's a wet site, so river birch would be appropriate. I'm not sure what the town's problem with sycamore was, but it's along the same vein. And I Sumac. think it's Sumac. Sumac. Yes. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. yeah. If I said sycamore. Understand sorry, that. So. All right. Never mind. I thought you said sycamore. Um, and you yeah. you take it out the sumac, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but that'll that'll be taken out. We'll probably add another species of dogwood and maybe some red maple or something. Yeah, Which, you know, I think this site will be managed, you know, um, you know, by crisis as the trees grow and, you know, affect, you know, we'll have drought and who knows what we'll have in the future. But I'm assuming that the trees as they go, if they don't make it, they'll be replaced, right? Um, yeah. You know, we're condensing 
I mean, to to try and replace trees on a building site that has no room for any trees is sort of silly to argue about. So <laughs> I'm not truly worried about the thermal impact on this site because it's so condensed and it's sort of not circular or square, but it's like literally got wany edges that um, could help provide some thermal buffer anyway, besides the forest that's being left intact everywhere else on the site. So, um, you know, as far as the trees are concerned, uh, climate wise, I'm not a huge fan of birch, but if they don't make it, I'm sure they'll be replaced because they're going to be front and center, right? They're going to be kind of visual. That's why the birch, yeah. everybody loves right. to see a birch tree. So um, I'm all for it. Yeah. 15, 20 years, they'll die off on the top. And yeah. Go. yeah. And you put in new ones. Yeah. <laughs> so so just just so the board knows, we are committed to putting the 12 trees in. Um, Sean, if, if, if they don't make it, we'll definitely, we'll obviously replace them and make sure that we have at least those 12 trees growing. Um, we've also committed to when we get once we do phase one and get our um, staging area and we get access to the property, we're going to be digging some pits and John's a soil specialist will be in there um, where the detention basins are. If there's any possibility um, that the detention basin was made smaller, then we'll definitely look at um, committing to a, you know a few more trees um, yeah. if that if that if that becomes the situation. Right. Okay. um just in the uh, uh dave in the 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 seed mix um as there's a you know the uh, town of deerfield is working with a lot of the pollinators and, and such um what's the mix provide for uh, pollinator aspects yeah much flowering earlier yeah. yeah um i don't have the list in front of me but uh, I believe there's uh, five or six wild uh, wildflower varieties in it. Okay, um, yeah, it's it's really got a broad spectrum of uh, you know it, it it's kind of very diverse because it'll adapt you know, over time. Yeah, uh, yeah, but, right. but but it it's 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 actually quite pretty when it matures. Um, you know the the dogwoods have flowers and fruits and has uh five or six different species of wildflowers in the understory interspersed with you know what i would call uh you know more natural grasses you know blue stems things like that okay any other comments from the commissioners Okay, Lucy, if you have uh, comments, otherwise we can move on to number three. Sure, number three, uh, we've also talked about are the formal test pits, and um, you, usually those are required as part of the stormwater permit, but in this case, uh, mm -hmm. they've been delayed to the beginning of construction, and so um, you might want to include as a condition of your approval that um, you require the applicant to submit the test pit results. I think Ken just talked about that. And, and to either uh, certify they're uh, going to stay with the existing design, the proposed design they've already presented, or change it um, to make the basin smaller or whatever um, they, they, uh, they decide based on those test pits. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything from the applicant? Uh, only there's a, a, a number of aspects uh, associated with that. So uh, right now, all the basins are proposed to be lined. Um, and uh, so if we do these tests and there is potential for one or two of them to be above uh, the groundwater elevation where we can meet the DP requirements, uh, you know, we will we will revise the design to um, incorporate infiltration which will also help to make the, the basin smaller because e even, you know, um, the, the putting in the liner is, is not free. So uh, getting rid of it on one or two basins is very desirable from a, a financial perspective. Uh, and particularly if we can make the basin smaller to uh, accomplish the stormwater management piece of it. Yep, understood. Any comments from the commissioners?
Okay, no, hearing none, um, I do agree that we would um, request the, um, you know, the smittal of the test pit information prior to construction and um, to include with that whether the, you know, certify whether, whether the design is going to change or not, you know, whether it's, and hopefully if it changes, it'll become less. Um, but, you know, if you're not going to put liners in, so we would want to uh, condition that to um, submit the test information prior to construction so that we could review it. The, the way that I presented it to the planning board was that what you're looking at here now from a design is the biggest it will get. It, right. it, will, it will not, we're not going to do tests and find out that it's going to get bigger because we have made very conservative as decisions on how the design went forward. If anything else, it's going to go the other way. It's going to get smaller. Yeah. Well, and that's great. But yeah, just uh, let us know how the uh, results come out and yeah. what, you know, uh, certify what the uh, design change would be. So that would be one of the conditions. So I think I need some clarification here. So it's when it comes to the construction, we plan on getting a building permit doing stage one, which is clearing some trees to get across the first and do the wetland first wetlands crossing. Then once we get in there, we'll be able to bring machines in and do these test pits. So I just want to make sure that this is before we build any buildings, um, but not before we clear any trees, because otherwise we can't get in there. Um, same problem that we, you know, that we've discussed about this. Right. And that would be within your SWEP design, Correct. right? It would say what you're doing, you're going to go in um to you know take out some of the trees but not stump them but then put erosion control in stump them out and so forth so yeah, that's right. why you want to see the swept and and go through that in in a lot of detail so we don't have it in front of us but yeah so i i think i have that right ken right absolutely 100 percent. yeah okay so, so i guess kind of building on what ken just asked uh, and just to make sure we're clear so does does ken as a uh, developer need to get a building permit to go on and clear trees because if he does then the condition of assigning these prior to a building permit um, is like an endless circle we can't give you the data before we get a building permit because we can't access the site and then we can't access the site until we get a building permit to clear trees so uh, i'm just curious uh how deerfield manages that i normally a uh, uh, once we get a, um, a permit, either from a planning board and, or a conservation commission or ZBA, whatever that case is, we're free to go in and cut trees, but just not build a building. So uh, can you clarify if that's the case in Deerfield? It, how does that relate to the test pits? I'm sorry. So so the, the way that, uh, independent of the building permit, so uh, once we get the commission's approval and we have the right from MassDOT to access the site, we're going to fill that area, build a, a, a rough construction road into the site, and then clear an area as a staging area. Then um, once that's set, uh, clear the site, but not stump it. Then we have access to where the detention basins are. We would do the test pits, then evaluate that. Um, and then while we're doing the design, Ken can be doing the erosion control around the site. So if he as a developer cannot cut the trees without a building permit, then we can't give you the soil data prior to a building permit coming in. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. I understand now. Um, we're fortunate tonight to have one of the select board people on with us. And I don't know enough about the building permit process. Uh, Tim Hilchey would, did you understand the question? Would you know? I do understand work? the question. Yeah. And it's kind of a um, catch 22 thing. Yeah, I think probably um, that's really a, it's unfortunate that Bob Walden isn't here, but I don't, I see this as like a two phase thing the access, which is the first phase, that provides the ability to get into the site to do the test bits. And um, as far as the building, permit goes you know if if bob is going to look at the building plans and and make a determination that the building plans meet code and that sort of thing it's possible that it could be done um but 
it's a question I think you need to direct to the, the building department because I'm, I'm not an expert. I would suggest that it, it's logical the way they've designed it, do the mass dot approved portion, which I think, does it involve an open bottom culvert and that sort of thing, or is that later? Uh, we would need that to, to do the driveway. So would, are you gonna use construction mats to get in to do the test pits, or are you gonna put a culvert in first? I'll, I will let Ken answer that. Yeah, so the first the first crossing we need to get done um, in the beginning, we will use mats to go across because we'll be cutting some trees and dragging them onto the property um, and stacking them nicely so we can get in there later and chip them. Um, once we get access to that, we will be clearing a swath around the outside of the area where we're allowed um, our maximum, um, you know, area to work with at in the very beginning, we'll be putting up silt fence to cross in, you know, all the way into that first staging area. Um, as we start to get the trees, the perimeter cleared, we'll be continue, continuing with the silt fence and the erosion control right away. Um, and then we'll be getting some trees cleared in there so that we can go in with a machine and start digging these pits with a John Soil Specialist. Maybe there could be a condition in there um, where all we can do is get in there, um, clear, clear the, clear the trees, do the test pits um, before, and get approval from um, the board, the, the conservation commission. Um, you know that the the test pits are correct, and or you know if there's any changes, get approval from those that they'd be smaller if they needed to be, um, and then at that point um, we could move on with um, stumping, clearing. Um, you know and finishing up and starting to, to get our construction project going. And Mr. Chair, if I could just make one more comment, it's possible that Bob Walden will be able to review a majority of the building code yeah. issues and proposed um, site development issues and that the remainder of it will involve if the, if the detention basins are gonna get smaller um, that he, he would 90% of the work could be done towards the, the building department's approval. So, um, mm. yeah, so I can't be more helpful. Yeah, no, it's uh, not in my area of expertise on the building inspectors area, but, um, it, uh, can, as you mentioned, the you know, condition of you know, if the building inspector allows the clearing of the trees and, and so forth to get in there and doing the test pits and then come back mm -hmm. to us for the approval from the CONCOM before stumping and so forth. Um, and we get the uh, erosion controls in place. You know, our main concerns is, is really phasing this in and, and getting the erosion controls in place around the um, area's activity before a lot goes on. So that's what we're trying to do as much upfront as possible, but uh, understand some of the um, other constraints. And that, that the plan will be in the SWIP. We'll detail mm -hmm. that specifically, um, but we, we really need to get in here and get access um, so we can dig these pits. Um, that's That's been our plan. And I, I, I can assure you the uh, erosion control measures will, um, be up to the EPA standards and we'll definitely um, be putting those in immediately. Um, that'll be the first things that we're doing is getting that um, those straw barrels and erosion control fencing in immediately. Okay, any other comments, questions on this item? Okay. Uh, saying none, uh, Lucy, I'll let you uh, continue. I think we're on number four. Number four, um, stormwater standard two is peak flow attenuation. Um, so uh, the latest stormwater model um, that we reviewed still had warnings, um, which indicated some errors in, in geometry within the model. Um, so we, we've discussed these warnings with, with John and uh, trying to resolve as many of them as we could. Um, but we don't have a, a clean model so far. But uh, since we've reviewed multiple versions of the model, 
we do think that the published results so far are um, almost there. So the word we used was approx <laughs> approximately accurate. Um, so, so moving on from the errors in the model, as the model stands right now, standard two is met at the final study for the site, which is at month 16. Um, however, we'll, we also wanted to note that in some design storms, the peak flow is increased to a portion of the wetlands on the site. Um, so uh, the commission would need to determine if the design was consistent with standard two or if uh, further attenuation would be required on site to meet the standard. Um, if you'd like, I could share my screen and show you where we where we see the increases. And um, and yeah, that'd be fine because it's um, yeah, it's thank a you. bit difficult to um, to to visualize. Um, so let's see. Um, so do does everybody see that? Uh, yes, I have so it. this is this is the uh, figure three from the stormwater model that shows all the the uh, drainage uh, areas and uh, reaches, et cetera. And so uh, when I previously said that the um, standard two was met uh, at the outlet of the site, that would be over here, uh, which is one sixteen. And so what we found was that these uh, two reaches here shown in blue, uh, have exceedances, and I'll show you uh, what those are in a second. And um, also, this to know, although this is not part of standard two, this reach does have a significant decrease in in uh, flow to it, which is a could be uh, evaluated by the commission as an issue if the wetland isn't getting the water it used to be getting. Um, so. Uh, back to explaining what's going on. So this is that first reach that I showed where we do have exceedances. So in the two year, the peak flow uh, goes from one CFS existing to 1.6 CFS proposed. Um, the volume, sometimes we look at the volume just to understand what's going on. And the volume does also increase um, quite a bit by almost, um, a double. Um, same thing in the 10 year, we see an increase from 3.7 to 4.1. And here we see a, a 0.2 acre foot increase in volume. And then the other reach that has exceedances is uh, this one, where we see about, um, about a 50% increase in peak flow and about 80% uh, increase in volume. 10 year is also exceeded a minor increase in the 25 year. Um, so, uh, that is where, um, uh, strictly speaking, the wetland, wetland regulations, um, uh, ask to look at the discharges to the, uh, wetlands and evaluate, um, what the increases are there. And, um, the other part of that comment, uh, hopefully I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, this is all okay. Um, is that the wetland on the front of the site um, between uh, uh, um, sorry between the main road five and ten and the site, which is called W three, um, is showing an, uh, a big decrease in peak flow. Um, say the two year is going from 0.4 to 0.1, and the ten year it's uh, 1.1 to three, so it's it's basically down to 25% of its um, existing condition. And um, that would be because the drainage area to that wetland was decreased um, from 1.7 acres to 1.1 acres. Um, so there's a change to that wetland. So again, if I go back to this, this is where the increases are that I was showing you. And this is where the decreases. This is the the yellow one is really not um, part of the regulation, the wetlands regulation. The the blue one is. <laughs> okay, and then there's a a net decrease at the outfall. Um, yeah, so this meets standard two, which is 
which yeah. is what the what the requirement is for say uh the stormwater permit from the planning board um this other part is more of a wetlands regulation issue can you uh just uh help me out on so i see the cfs's but what would the what's the volume um within that discharge area uh, can you kind of um well, so, so just like what would it be is it eight inches ten inches two feet <laughs> oh so these are um so in a so if we talk about this first uh, mm -hmm. water, this first reach um here are the volumes and these are in acre feet so feet. um okay. so that's a quarter acre foot is the existing condition and uh 0.47 acre feet is the proposed condition. So that would be uh, 0.22 acre feet. Um, I could translate that to cubic feet or something, if that would help. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of volume and just what the sizing might look like. And, um... So uh, let me just do that count. Uh, so it's a 0.22 acre I'm feet. Much better engineer than I am. <laughs> I mean, another way to look at it is a quarter acre foot means if the wetland is an acre, there's going to be a quarter of a foot of water on it. And it's going to be a quarter, a quarter of, of a foot, foot, four inches. Yep. Of acre. Over an acre, yes. And so that's the, in the two year storm, um, the difference in volume. Uh, the increase in volume being put into that reach of the wetland is about uh, 9,600 cubic feet. Okay, so a quarter inch of volume versus a half inch over Correct. In, that, in that one area. Yeah. But um, and, but we're really not talking. We're we're talking about a reach here. It, so this is this is yeah. um, where these two come together. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really how that it's a it's the conveyance, right, of the, mm -hmm. the wetland is being so. Um, this is I I don't believe this is an acre. It's just a a conveyance, yeah. um, which is receiving uh, more flow and more more volume. So it's an acre that wouldn't be static, or it's, it's flowing through, and there'd be reduction in volume, and yeah, in heights and stuff. Okay, just trying to get a sense of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Where does that end up? Um, I mean, it's not. Well, I did. I didn't do this. So th these two fingers uh, join up into this. This finger joins them. Sorry about the blue thing. Uh, then they go this way, and then they go out to the uh, to Route One Sixteen. John, you could probably explain this better than I can. But, but I guess what I'm thinking is the overall flow out into 116 isn't increased. It's just the inner part that is. Is that what you're right. saying? That's yes. Right. And so the, the this is what the stormwater permit would would uh, um, control yeah. or, or evaluate. This the internal part is is uh, the wetlands regulations. Um, I I 310 CMR something or other that I can find here. And so, Kate, that you know, it would be like okay. more standing water in that yeah. wetland area, and what that would, you know, mean to that that given wetland within that um, that run there. Yeah. Um, well, if, if I could add something. Yes. Yeah. What one of the other items that uh, Berkshire had us or asked us to evaluate, uh, which I think we presented at the last meeting, were the velocities at the discharge points and we provided uh, a, a guidance that we saw so the DEP uh, in their stormwater management policy has uh, maximum safe uh, discharge velocities for various types of ground cover and then what the guidance policy says that if you exceed these velocities at the discharge location then you uh, add protection which could be you know reinforced turf or most likely it's riprap so uh, on the previous response to comment letters we provided the velocities at all of the locations which were below 
the recommended maximum velocities by the DEP. And we also added uh, a riprap plunge pools at each of those outlets. So erosion from water leaving these systems is not a concern. We, we are less than the DEP velocities and we are, are providing protection. Um, when we looked at these interim uh, 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 evaluation points or design points, we, we looked at it because you're comparing a design point that is there existing and uh, flow going to that design point is from a, a wooded area. Now we've got buildings and pavement and discharge from uh, detention basins. So we are going to see an increase in these internal um, uh, uh, design points. When we look at the DEP requirement for standard two, we how we interpret it was that uh, we need to prove that there is no downstream flooding from the project area. And that's why we focused our efforts on uh, the design point right before it goes under 116. Uh, when we first met with the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, one of the uh, abutters on the other side of 116 uh, stood up and said he was very concerned about stormwater because his fields flood. And when we approached this uh, stormwater design, we focused on that because that has the most benefit to him. And we wanted to make sure that we did not impact anybody downstream from the site. And that's that's what our design is based on. All right. Um, you know, and, and one of the things to think about with the volumes is, you know, when we say, okay, currently it's a quarter acre foot, assume it's a one acre reach which it's probably not, I agree with that. There'd be, you know, just under half a foot of water. If I understand these aren't closed bases, there's their flows, they're, they're, they have a hydraulic gradient. So you're not necessarily gonna see any dramatic increases in uh, the water levels that would occur during these storms. Right, there'd be yeah. an increase, but there's also uh, discharge levels yes. of the flow and the hydraulics and and what can be accommodated downstream and so forth and so on. Yeah, um, yeah, just kind of interesting uh, thing to get your head around. Um, and and I would also state that uh, standard two in the Wetlands Protection Act regulations. It's, it solely talks with peak discharge rates, not yeah. volumes. Okay. And because what's the, how's the peak defined, uh, David? Is it, it over it, set period of time? It's just uh, it, it discharges uh, velocity time cross sectional area of the flow. So that's at the height of the storm. The highest. The, yeah. Yeah. So that would be the maximum height. Right, the peaks are are were what I circled in red. I yeah. I added the volumes just for context. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I I personally feel like when you're talking about flows under five cubic feet per second, you know, they're they're it's it that's not a lot of that's not a lot of discharge. Okay, uh, you know. So right. going going from one point five to two point two, uh, unless you develop some really detailed way of measuring that, I don't think visually you could even see that. 
And yeah. then, you know, as as John pointed out, I think at the planning board, probably in a meeting with these folks, now, this is all estimates. This is, you know, you do the best you can, but it's a computer model. It's not based on real. And because of that, there's, you know, many provisions where you estimate on the high side to come up with the most conservative approach. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what John has done with this site. You know, his bases okay. may be too big, but he's erring on the side of protection. Okay. All right. I, I thank you all for that. I think I have a better understanding and yeah, um, there's just so many other factors of how the stream will be, what's in the way and what roots are there and what everything coming out. So yeah, anyways, okay. Any other comments on um, item four? Yeah, I, I'd just like to add that um, south of where we'll be making our second wetlands crossing, um, all the way to 116, um, the water flows through that that blue area. Um, it's not a sitting area in there. Um, yeah. Of course, I've been in there a lot. Um, I'm on this property often. The water just flows through there. Um, and I think the big thing is the discharge that we're equal or under um, yeah. what, exists, what exists today. Because I, I remember walking out there at the end of that basin, once it gets closer to 116, it, it does flow pretty well, but there's actually a, a pretty wide area of um, uh, shrubbery swamp type of, of thing going out there. So there's, there's probably a, a pretty good um, area to contain a lot of water. That's what I'm thinking in, in that area too. So, okay. As long as we meet the, the outside criteria, that sounds good. Any other comments from anybody or the commissioners? Yeah, I don't know if it's intentional, but uh, the assistant town administrator has got a hand up. I don't, I think it might yeah. be. I was just, I was waiting for a, a break oh. and I think this is it. Um, to let you know <laughs> that uh, I texted Bob Walden uh, earlier about uh, the building permit issue and the tree clearing. And he says, uh, no, you do not need a building permit before you start the tree clearing. Um, just site plan and CONCOM approval and the building permit is just for building construction. So that should settle that okay. issue. So then, yeah, okay, great. So then we can uh, do the condition, we clear the trees, do the test pits, and then get approval from CONCOM before uh, stumping. Uh, but you can go ahead with that. I, I think that's good, Ken, right? I yep, think that's that, good. Okay, answers that question. Um, thank you, Amy, for doing that. And I apologize for not seeing your hand. My oh, no, too no, many no, screens no, going on here. <laughs> no, I just I didn't want to break into your deliberations. They were very no. serious. Um, just hey, uh, one yes. one thing to clarify is, although this wetland this has nothing to do with standard two, but the um, this wetland is receiving much less flow uh, than it does currently. In case that is a concern for the commission, right? And that and that would. If I'm, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at my screen. You can't see. I don't have a. <laughs> but they end on the south side of the yellow would end up at the south side of the blue, and then head out to the discharge uh, to one sixteen at some point. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yes. it's just so. this particular reach uh, because the drainage areas um, were mostly uh, for the development were. Um, um, uh, pr prioritize or they mostly go towards the blue, whereas in existing condition, there's more drainage area towards the the yellow. Mm -hmm. So I I am just pointing out um, that that this wetland is not will not receive the same um, flow as it does in existing conditions mm -hmm. uh, so, flow yeah. or or volume because the drainage area was decreased by about um, by about uh, a third or 30 percent or something. I think I saw it. Yeah. About one point by point six. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that would dry that out. out a little bit. Yeah. Um, so some changes. Okay. No, that's, that's good to know. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, I'm sorry for getting my engineering hat on and looking at all the details to everybody else, but, um, 
I appreciate it. Um, so do we move on to then uh, number five, Lucy? Sure. Um, so uh, five is about um, limiting disturbance. Um, and so um, as we've said before, the, the proposed detention basins have excess capacity. Um, some basins um, are only about 25 to 30% full in the 100 year storm. Um, so to split the, this comment into two pieces, limiting disturbance, the one, the first one part is disturbance in the riverfront. Um, we, we've worked quite a lot with the stormwater model and it's our opinion that uh, basin 1A, which is located in the riverfront, could be reduced or, or actually eliminated. Um, so um, the wetlands regs require the applicant to evaluate alternatives to disturbance in the riverfront. So um, we, we just made the comment that you, uh, the commission might want to determine if they would like further evaluation to uh, satisfy that alternatives analysis. Um, that would be the, the uh, disturbance in the riverfront. And then uh, limiting disturbance in the buffer. Um, again, um, that would be the comment about reducing the basin size. Um, and so uh, again, uh, we our comment was that you uh, may want to determine if the project has adequately uh, mitigated potential wetland impacts um, by limiting disturbance. Okay, and that's the disturbance from the, uh, the tent. Okay, I uh, have a couple of questions, um, but um, anything from the applicants uh, to respond to that? Yes, the uh, the solution to both of those items is the performance of the test pits. Um, if we did evaluation right now, we'd be basing it on record information that we already did the design on. Um, so uh, our recommendation would not change if you asked us to do it tomorrow because we have the same data. But if we can go out, access the site, do test pits, we get results that we can actually base our design on. Um, making it smaller is is desirable, both from uh, you know the impacts to the wetlands, the riverfront area, and from a cost perspective for the whole development. So uh, I don't. It's my opinion we can't answer that tonight uh, because we don't have the data. Uh, we based it on the data that was available, and uh, I think it goes back to our uh, our comments about doing the formal test pits, which is number three, and um, you know up, uh, justifying the stormwater model once we have the chance to do the test pits and and see if we can make any re recommendations for reducing. Yeah, okay. So then on the stormwater, uh, I'm sorry, on the riverfront area in the front, um, potentially that could be reduced um, or eliminated, right? It, it could. One of our initial designs, uh, I think, that we had before our first filing with um, the commission it had an actual much larger base, base in there, and it was only basin one. There was no 1A, 1B. And uh, when David evaluated that, he asked if we could reduce it. And that's what basically uh, uh, made 1B come into existence so we could uh, connect the two and reduce the riverfront area. So we have an alternative going the other way. This would be the solution uh, for that. And you know, having another one would be doing the test pits to see whether we could eliminate it. OK. So I'd, I'd just like to add to that, Pete, that um I, I believe it was berkshire requested that we go in uh and do some hand tests so john Furman and the soil specialist and i we went in there um recently dug some test pits um it was conclusive that they were as same as all the data that we've had from multiple times we've dug dug in there um, and, and dug, done corings there was one area in the back that potentially um he was trying to determine whether maybe maybe it wasn't quite as high um but we it, it was conclusive that the the you know the water level uh, groundwater level was the same as all the other results that we've got 
Um, so I, I I don't foresee a lot of change, um, but believe me, I mean, if we can if we can save money, we'd love it. But I also don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want them to be undersized to the point where, you know, we're getting these storms like six and a half inches in seven days that we just got. Um, and, and, and then, you know, storm after storm after storm. And we have we never want to have a condition where there's an issue. So we felt we feel this is conservative, but it's uh, it's 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 needed. Um, and if there is a, an ability to change once we get in there and, and do test pits again for probably the, the third time, um, then then we'll get back to you with those results and we can work through that with you. OK. So uh, um, go ahead. Could I say something? Um, yeah. I. I uh, I'm hearing both uh, sides here that this may change or it may not change. And I am confused about how a test pit uh, will change a dry detention basin. A test pit would tell you uh, about your lining, whether you want to line it or not, or it would tell you that you might be able to infiltrate if you have two feet of separation. But uh, I don't think, I think that um, right now that the model as it is could be uh, could be refined and the basins could be made smaller without any test pit results because um, you already have your the um, drainage areas everything's all defined and so um, I if this is going to be let go to the test pit uh, time of when you get the test pit results, I don't see how what the criteria will be for reducing that. And I wouldn't want the commission to feel that they will be reduced uh, if they're not going to be. So John, I think you can comment on this, John. Well, I, I think I, it's I think I think it's directly related to the groundwater level. Um, and we know that the groundwater is high and I don't believe that we will meet the two foot criteria, but let, let John comment a little bit on this. Uh, I, 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 uh, I guess professional uh, indifference to what Lucy uh, just said. I, I, I feel differently. Um, the test pits are actually going to allow us to determine whether we can infiltrate, which will also bring the, the basins uh, uh, down in size because we can infiltrate water versus putting it through uh, an outlet control structure. Well, while I understand uh, Lucy's comment about uh, the, the model right now can be adjusted and made smaller to reduce some of the, the freeboard uh, uh, distance uh, between the high water mark and the, the top of the basin, um, the, the end result is that uh, we're going to may have to do it again when we do the, uh, the test pitting. So uh, the, the difference is, is that we, we need to justify the analysis and that's what we're, we're proposing. We made the same um, uh, request of the planning board and, and they agree that that would be all right as long as we follow through with the test pitting and uh, the review of the, the model. Just a couple other points. Um, you know, DP did have, you know, analysis of alternatives in riverfront area and they called out that detention basin and in response to that comment john and i looked very closely at that he was able to basically have its size that was in riverfront area so that was a significant reduction and also you know just so the commission is aware we're well below the uh, amount you can permit to alter riverfront area, uh, which is 10% of the site or 10% of the riverfront area of the site or 5,000 square feet, whichever is greater. Um, so we comply with that standard. Also, there's language in the riverfront area performance standards that specifically fall out, you know, that detention basins can be located in riverfront area provided there's no practicable alternative. Um, and they don't go towards your threshold of how much impacts you can have. We included them anyway. Um, so I think 
that answer was significant enough for DEP. And then the last point I would bring up is, is looking at this more for what's gonna happen in the future. You know, we're all aware of climate change. We're gonna have extended periods of drought. We're gonna have more frequent storm events uh, that have more participation and higher intensity rainfalls. So is it really a bad thing if the basin is a little bigger? to accommodate, you know, the uncertainty we face. Um, you know, many towns are now considering changing their regulations to, you know, provide 1.5 times for the storage. Um, obviously, developers and engineers don't like that, but, you know, they're concerned about what's going to happen in the future. And I'll uh, shut up at this point. <laughs> Yep, very apple. Um, no, a lot of lot of good information. Anything else from the commissioners? Any questions, comments? I think this one will again go back to to the test pit data, um, and you know we condition that in the review after the uh, test pit results and and see where where we head from there. Um, okay. Anything else from everybody on this item? Um, number six, wetland number replacement six. area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, uh, our comment on the wetland replacement area, I think is similar to the previous one in that, um, there were, uh, a lot of items that were not included in the um the report that that uh, we received um so there are a lot of items in the dep checklist like having a cross section of the area and specific locations for the plantings and elevations to the quarter foot um so um those the uh those details were not provided and um the commission may may like to see more information for that uh, replacement area. Yeah, more info is always good, but- um, Can I respond to that? Again, Dave? Yeah, uh, so, John, yeah. you know, I've probably done 125, 150 of these, you know, starting back from the early 80s to current day. And as a conservation area agent, I've monitored, you know, probably another hundred of them. Uh, you can put a ton of information on a plan, but in all reality, from what I've learned is the decisions are made in the field. I could put in quarter foot contour intervals, but quite honestly, what's gonna be done is, uh, we're going to establish where the water table is, and then we're going to create a series of mounted depressions that look naturalistic, um, quarter of a foot high to a quarter of a foot deep. The elevation of the bottom is based on the information we have to date. It was based on depths of groundwater taken in the adjacent wetland. Um, it's similar, but until we excavate out that area, you don't know what's going to happen. One thing about this particular site is it's underlain by clay, and that was evident in the boring I took in the wetland. It's basically got, uh, hang on, let me pull up my notes. Sticks. Uh, Topsoil layer that's six to eight inches in thick, that's underlain by uh, clay, silty clay, glacial lake, Hitchcock lake, lake bottom. So that that helps because we're going to use that, and more than likely, what we're going to find is the groundwater seeps in from the adjacent areas, from the contact between the more pervious material on top and the clay. Um, so the clay will basically provide 
for the the pits. It's going to be impervious. We'll have it. You know, we're going to put a uh, eight inch layer thick of topsoil over everything. But you know, again, this is kind of all done in the field. I don't like to have wetlands that look like detention basins. Okay, with maybe a couple of pits and bounds in them. It's creating these things to mimic naturalistic conditions and provide, you know, all the ecological benefits that you want them to provide is something that is done during the construction phase. Um, if you, the, the contours that are shown on the wetland replacement plan were taken from the existing conditions plan that is stamped and signed by a PLS. Um, if you desire that the replacement plan be stamped, we can provide you one as a condition of approval. That's no problem. And with respect to the cross section, you know, I kind of explained about the floor. It's, it's going to be developed at during the excavation process, but you know, the side slopes are two to one. Uh, which is mimics what the side slopes are in all the earthwork that's going on in the adjacent areas. Um, if a cross section is really needed, we can provide one. That's, that's no problem. Um, I just, you know, personally, I, I, as a wetland scientist, I don't think a PE stamp on a wetland replacement plan provides you with much value. And I know I probably just upset two people on this. <laughs> <laughs> no, sitting no. In here. But, you know, I, I, I know John Furman agrees with me because we've worked together in the past, but uh, he'd be happy to review it and stamp it if that's needed. Um, that's true. Yep. Yeah, just going by the DEP checklist, uh, you know, as a guide, since I, I've never done this. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, since that's the tool to review, that's what. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so David, um, this is Pete, if I could just jump in here maybe, because my past is a lot of field work too, and I know things happen in the field, and you got to figure it out on the field, and, and so forth, and I, and I appreciate your... Oh. You know, your input about, you know, sharing natural conditions, but in looking at this checklist or in looking at the contours and the, the slopes, the two to ones, um, without getting into a lot of the stamp documents that, you know, we'll only end up with a lot of mud out in the field and we'll see what we can do anyways. Um, you know, are there options that you could provide that you will be looking at in the field and how you would how you would approach this, you know, just kind of a general guideline of what um, you'd be considering in the field to be done. Well, uh, or let me let me let me pull up the the plan. Uh, it's hidden under a bunch of things here, and so, I don't want to get into it too far. I mean, the, no, you, no, you, you get no, all your that's, yes. expertise and everything out so, in the field so, and so forth. And, so some of the things that can be determined during the excavation process is, you know, you may have to excavate lower than you initially intended. That can yeah. easily be done. Um, sometimes you encounter groundwater higher, or sometimes you encounter a sloped groundwater condition. In that case, we'd probably want, you know, our replication area floor to, to not be overall flat, you know, we probably started at a higher elevation towards the uplands. Um, but those are some of the things that are done in the field, you know. Um, the plan, uh, the general notes on the plan talks about mm -hmm. these things, uh, yeah. as well as the narrative that accompanies it, uh, talks about, you know, deviations of this amount are, you know, considered normal, but yep. if there's extreme changes, obviously we have to come back to you folks. And yep. that is, that is stated on the plan that. Yeah. I, I was uh, looking I, at those. Okay. Is, 
modifications to this plan may require author authorization from the Deerfield Conservation Commission. Okay. Uh, it, it also talks about when a uh, ecologist needs to be on site and what aspects they need to sign off on. And, you know, you can reference that in your order condition and has to be copied on, you know, uh, yeah. field reports for those steps, as well as the monitoring reports once it's done. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Cause I did note on the, uh, you know, so in the notice to us on significant changes and uh, because we didn't get a lot of the information up front, um, I wasn't able to spend a lot of time with the orders of conditions. So we're going to have to kind of work around the categorization of tonight and, and work on those over the next couple of weeks before we sign this off. But we do have, you know, within the town of Deerfield, I don't know, 70, 75 special orders of conditions, and they cover a lot of this stuff. You know, yeah. we need reports, we need to no be notified, we need this, yeah. we need that. Some of it's going to be applicable and some not. But right. I wasn't able to, because I didn't get the information in, and the commission didn't, to, to review just what some of these issues are going to be before we set out the special order conditions. Um, so we're, we're going to have to work through some of that. But I, I believe, David, what you're talking about is going to be covered in some of our language. It's yeah. also covered within the design plans yeah. um, in, in somewhat detail that you have to come to us. But we'll have more specific language that if, you know, it's any significant differences, you know, you, you have to reach out, um, yeah. different meetings and, and such of that nature. So I, I think I'm, I'm okay here, but, um, any other commissioners, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to talk about all the special order conditions here. I, we're, we can't go through them all tonight. Um, uh, I think we take this somewhat offline and, and present them to all the different people involved and then tr try to get, which I was trying to do before this meeting, you know, some kind of consensus on what the orders of conditions would be. Um, we've talked about some tonight, but there's there's so many other ones that are, you know, kind of specifics of what, what we want to see. Um, but anyways, anything else from the commissioners? I didn't mean to be rambling on here. No. John, can anybody else? Okay. Um, Lucy, anything more on that? Or do you think we, oh. we can cover it? Okay. Um, down to the wetland crossings. Number seven. Yeah. Last. Um, <laughs> so the first part of the comment is, is just relating back to the fact that the ANRAD uh, calls out the... Um, the, the the there are intermittent streams on the site and before the crossings are designed that the, the uh, bank etc should be flagged so uh, we would recommend that that you make a final determination on the need for additional delineation to determine if the crossing is a wetland or a stream crossing um and then number two as you know these are designed as wetland crossings um, there are two by four, two foot by four foot box culverts on 12 inches of stone. And then the culverts are filled with six inches of earth. And there are riprap aprons on uh, the upstream end and the, or the uphill end and the downhill end and the down, <laughs> upstream yeah. and downstream, each side yeah. of the yeah. <laughs> And um, higher and lower one. <laughs> <laughs> We recommend that the commission uh, determine whether uh, those those crossings, the way they're designed, meet the criteria uh, for natural bottom and also hydraulic and ecological connectivity, uh, because that's required in that Massachusetts general permit that's issued by the Army Corps. Okay. I do have some comments about uh, anything from the applicants. Uh, sure, I'll I'll try to address both those. So, you know. Uh, I didn't do the flagging. I do know that the uh, consultant who did it was provided with the crossing locations. And in looking at the plans, um, they basically show bank, then it stops, then it turns into bank further up gradient. Okay. That's consistent with what I saw at the first crossing. Okay. There's a section between where the flow uh, 
either comes in or goes under that, that big culvert upstream of the crossing. And then when you go further downstream, there's a very evident stream channel. And remember, streams are features that have a definite channel that mm -hmm. flow because of a hydraulic gradient. Now, that's not to say that if you get like, you know, a 10 year storm, a 25 year storm, that you're not going to see water flowing through those areas. But, you know, on a typical mean annual high condition, you're not getting flows through there. And the second stream crossing was the same. Uh, and there's no bank flags there as well. If you looked very closely, you could see some leaf staining, a little bit of areas of leaves being pushed, but you know the staining kind of implies that the water was sitting there; it wasn't mm -hmm. flowing. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable. Uh, you know, obviously, you folks have to make the determination, but you know, in my field observations. I know why the consultant put that line in the NRAD because you know where the crossings were ultimately going to end up. And there are a lot of streams on that site that he did not flag, mainly to save time. And because in likelihood, that area would never be crossed. But I would put the same line in an NRAD I did. Um, I might have been a little more specific about it, but I would say there were sections of stream uh, bank that had not been flat. Um, to go on to the compliance with the with the Army Corps, um, you know, I did review their guidelines, and we're looking at the guidelines for wetland crossings, not stream crossings. Okay, and basically what they say. So at a distance of at least every 50 feet, you put in a culvert. That's a minimum of two by two, I believe it is. Um, and it should either be open bottom box or be lined with a natural substrate, which is what's going to be done here. Um, the natural substrate in this area, you know, where these is is wetland soils we're making wetland soils for the replication area we can make some more or we can scrape the ones off where the crossings are going and line them in the culvert to a depth of six inches uh, as far as ecological connectivity you know these crossings are you know i i estimated here that during a 10-year storm the the flow through there might be one foot wide. Uh, these are two, so it, it's kind of the, the rule of thumb is 1.2 times the bank flow width, um, which these meet. And uh, as far as, um, you know, putting in bigger culprits, if you were going to put in uh, vertical retaining walls along these crossings, which you're not, they're going to be naturally stabilized. Or if you're going to put in uh, chain link fencing, uh, you might have to worry about movement of larger mammal species. But because these just have guardrails and that they're not vertical, while you know the larger wildlife species can easily um, go up the slope and depending on their size either cross under or jump over the, mm -hmm. the guardrails yeah huh. um, and then that 1.2 times the bank width which again we're really not dealing with the stream is considered to be an adequate width to provide movement of the smaller wildlife species yeah I'd just like to add, Pete, that, you know, we got six and a half inches in, in uh, less than a seven day period. Um, I was out there just a few days later. Um, I, we don't believe that this area where we're crossing, uh, 
is defined as a, a stream. It's just a wetlands. I was walking through there with my sneakers. Um, there's really virtually zero flow um, through that area. Um, there is no defined area um, at all. Um, it's about 20 something, maybe 30 feet wide there. Um, yeah. I could have walked through with my church shoes um, if I had them with me that day. Yeah. No, I, I think, boy, it, there's too many meetings on this, but you know, that when the ANRAD and when you had the peer review on it, we kind of went through some of that stuff. And yeah. Um, so uh, I, I I think the consultant then was somewhat satisfied and maybe we didn't get it uh, switched over from an intermittent stream, but that's great. Um, I mean, that's fine. I'm sorry. Um, the box culverts, uh, just to say, Dave, the the natural bottom will be wetlands um, soil substrate from the area. Is that what you're? Yeah, it'll either yeah. be from the area, provided there's no invasive species, which I yeah. do not believe okay. there are there. Um, okay. Or if there is invasive seed stock or the timing somehow ends up being, because you, you can't stockpile wetland soils. Yeah. For a long period of time they start to break down right. um, obviously we'll keep them wet and cover them with tarps but you know if for some reason it's a season before the culverts are in um like the the wetland uh replacement area we're going to do a manufactured wetland soil um okay which is, uh you know works like a charm from my experience and yeah uh, no, okay, that's good. And that's uh that's good. Any other questions from anybody else? Any comments? Uh Lucy, any hands up. Um, I was just good I would just say that it I think it would be a good idea um to represent what David said about the um natural substrate, maybe uh either on the plans or um so it's not confused. Um because the plans say um uh earth bottom. Yeah. So oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice to clarify that so it 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 uh, does what you want it to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's another condition here, Dave. If we could update the plans to show that the um, um, the the um, area wetlands uh, soil substrate or manufactured wetlands soils would be utilized. Yep. That makes sense. Yes. Okay. Just for some more clarifications, Pete, um, when we make this first wetlands crossing, John will be out there with me um, inspecting the soil that we're taking out of that area. Um, that soil um, will be put back into these box culverts. Um, they're three sided with open top. Um, we'll be taking the highest quality soil that, you know, and John and his soil scientist will be there to let us know. Um, and and putting our six inches in the bottom of this um these basins these uh, uh basins the, the box culverts and then and yeah then finishing up finishing up the construction so we'll be getting the uh the the best wetland soil we can to line the, the bottom of these culverts yeah good um i think i think that works any other questions from the commissioners anybody else in the audience um so Lucy, I think we've gone through your your concerns. Everything yeah. set? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, any other comments from the applicant? From the commissioners? Yeah, John. The uh, only thing uh, I just wanted to bring up is that uh, we've had a, a little bit of flip flopping on the actual culverts. The initial ones that we submitted had two culverts in it uh, and then through the course of investigation uh ken had uh thought that uh, having one larger culvert was uh more acceptable so the plants that you have in your record right now has one larger culvert at that front crossing and that's uh, at the front then, crossing okay yeah since then uh the 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 vendor that ken talked to identified that having a larger culvert was a longer delivery time. So we went back to the two culverts. So okay. I, I have one one uh, plan updated to update to, to by the commission, which basically shows those two culverts instead of the one. 
Okay, so my plan over there that I'm looking at of my side is it's probably correct, but it's not correct. <laughs> yeah, just if yeah. you want to just draw a line down the middle, you'll be correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can work on that. Yeah, John, I, I was confused about that myself, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we in our investigations, P, we found it was extremely long lead time to get one of these larger. Um, box culverts and just right now they have these two by fours uh, readily available um they weigh a lot less for the pick um so it's 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 a much easier construction um timeline and and it works much better for us and they're actually mm -hmm. smaller smaller and easier to work with um yeah it's highly unlikely we'll need to get a crane in there or anything we'll be able to set them with the excavator um, so this is we we felt this was much better as timeline um, and and much easier to you know place this soil in them and get a good job done. Okay. Yep. Okay. Great. So we'll look at that update, uh, John. If you just supply that, that'd be great. Any other questions from comments from anybody from the applicants, from the commissioners, from anybody else on the call? Well, this has been, uh, I look back and it's, I'm a couple of years older since we started this, I think, um, as, as we all are. Um, so I just want to thank everybody to well, all your patience over the time and all the input um, along with this. Uh, I appreciate it much. Uh, it is quite a project. Um, and us as a commission, I mean, we're, we're working for the, uh, keeping a, Eye out for the, uh, you know, the the well-being of the of the town of Deerfield and and also with the state with the um, with the wetlands issues. So uh, I appreciate everything and everybody's work on this. Um, I'm a little bit stuck right now, and I would take comments from the commissioners in that there will be a lot of conditions, and I wrote down a lot tonight, and <laughs> I have scraps of paper all over the place um and, and kate i'm sure you do too um there'll be the special order conditions that i'd want to get out to uh Ber both berkshire design group and the applicant and everybody to take a look at to see which ones are applicable see which ones that we need to negotiate um so we can probably move ahead with a decision one way or another but it has to be contingent on review of conditions before final, you know, signatures and, and final approval. Um, so I'm just kind of um, not quite sure because I didn't get all the information and, 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 and we, we just need to go back and forth on a few more things of how we want to proceed. So commissioners, uh, any other thoughts on processing? Contingent so, on the contingents list. <laughs> yeah. Um, if we can approve the notice of intent tonight, um, none of our special order conditions would impact the timber cutting operation, sort of the phase one of getting the, the first staging area and starting. I, I'm asking more than stating. Um, some of them would, you know, for notifications and and so forth, and contact information. There's there's certain so orders or conditions. To, that... Approval tonight, based on the contingency of approving and agreeing to special order conditions, really is just setting another meeting date anyway, no matter what, to talk about the special order of conditions. Correct. We can approve the NOI now and. It, contingent upon uh, review of the special order of conditions from the town. And once that's done, they're already set to move. Or we can review the special order of conditions at another date and approve at the end of that. That's yeah, our two options, right? See that, that as the two options and... Um, can I just um, point out that um, if you approve, I mean, I can't submit it without the conditions, so I'm not sure. 
Um, it can't go to DEP without the conditions, right? That's on the uh, form. Yeah. Um, um, and I, I, I it would just take hours and hours of going through this tonight, line by line, and, and going through everything. I don't know if we can pull that off. Um, so once you close a public hearing, you have 21. Yeah. 21 days to issue the order, right. uh, yep. which is three weeks, and provided, um, you know, that you're not going to restrict any input from us in Berkshire. Um, I think that's a good approach. Well, Close it. But I think closing the hearing would restrict any other, and further input. Because uh, it would be closed. It would close the hearing. To correct, so I couldn't get additional input from either of the parties. And what we're trying to do is look at verifying the special order of conditions. So that's why I'm kind of struggling here. On if I close out the hearing, am I? Um, can we discuss or not discuss? But I, I think they've clearing out the closing the hearing precludes us from discussing further or having other input from public or anything of that nature. And and I would just add, I think you do want to be cautious that way because if you close it out and you have to reopen it, then it's um, another for an NOI. Is it? I guess it's. I have to give notice in the paper again, yeah, which is yeah. ten days out. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would err on the side of caution. I just was wondering if you could close contingent upon the uh, development of a order of conditions that is agreeable by all parties. One concern I would have with that is uh, it's a it's a full meeting to review the special order of conditions. Um, and I, I can assume no one on your on the applicant side has even seen Deerfield's special order of conditions because they're new to new for us in terms of working with them. Um, so mm -hmm. it might be in your own best interest to not want us to close the hearing tonight. So that you have time to look at all of the particulars of our special order of conditions, which would be following, right, our review this meeting and well, it's obviously the the applicant's choice. Yeah. <laughs> obviously, he doesn't want to request that it be closed if the outcome is going to be that the project is denied. Um, I can appreciate that we've talked about a lot of different things. You are dealing with a new kind of boilerplate order. And that's, you know, it's a pretty big task to go through all your notes. Um, I don't know if you would be receptive where you could send us your standard order. And we could add in what we feel are the particulars. And, and David, that's exactly what I was hoping okay. you know, uh, that would have occurred over the last two or three days. If we had yeah. some of this yeah. information in front of us, I say, okay, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. Here's the standard order conditions. Let's go through them all. Um, but now, but my problem is legally, I'm, I'm the, the, the issue of, closing the hearing um, contingent upon um, further discussion, <laughs> which when you close the hearing, you're not supposed to have any further discussion. So that's where I'm kind of kind of stuck at. I should have been a lawyer, but oh well. <laughs> um, we can get, you know, standard order conditions out to you, like probably uh, Amy you could send them out tonight or we could uh, send them out first thing in the morning is kind of mm -hmm. looking at it. Now, I wouldn't 
have a chance to go through those and pick out the one. There's going to be some in there that's just not applicable at all. Yep. So yep. understand that, um, you know, some will come to you and you can just delete. Yep. Um, but let me think. Um, I do see uh, Tim Hilchy has a hand up and maybe he has some. Uh... <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to, um, I, when this project started, I was the Conservation Commission Chair and we were just uh, adopting um, a standard order of conditions that one of our consultants designed for us, but it's based on the recommendation of the Massachusetts Conservation Commission. So you've seen probably anybody who's worked in Massachusetts has seen these conditions numerous times. And I would agree, Pete, that a, a reasonable a reasonable thing would be to you know go through and even yourself, you know, pencil in the things you don't think apply, send them to the applicant in Berkshire Design and um, have a back and forth. Um, and then at the next possible meeting date, as early as practicable, go through all of them and reach some sort of agreement. Because um, you don't yeah. want to close the hearing and, and uh, then find you need to reopen it for some Reopen time. everything, yeah. Reason. Yeah, no, it's, I don't want the Attorney General after my butt. But other than <laughs> the things you've talked about tonight, most of the, yeah, I'm sure that David and John have seen all of these things yeah. and other projects they've worked on. Yeah, and there's a few specific to this area. Now, our next yeah. schedule meeting is um, the 25th. Um, Ken, does that throw you off on scheduling? Um, waiting in two more weeks, or? No, we can work with you guys, Pete. Um, obviously, we're not. So we need these conditions to finalize our access with the mass DOT. Um, so this this is very important to us moving forward. Um, yeah. So yeah, if that's the soonest possible date, um, then then we'll work with you guys. It's been okay. uh, twenty five months. I think twenty five months. <laughs> okay. I've been working yeah, on this two project. Years, yeah. <laughs> so um, I mean, in, in at the very end, we don't we don't want to do something that's that that's not right for either party um for the conservation commission or myself and my team so okay. i i, I no, think we, that's fine okay yeah we just def definitely want to work with you but i just um because we can't send this thing to dep and they have to review the noi without the conditions and that may start over and we just waste a lot more time so um i'm just trying to work with you all and i, I think there's a lot of the you know everything's been answered and we're in a good spot um but we just need to go through some of these conditions and agree to them and if we can do that you know the meeting's in two weeks from now 14 days so if we can do that in 10 days and we have a chance to review it beforehand um it should Can't be I'm sorry, I just, I just want to jump in here to let you know, I just received two RDAs today that will have to be heard within the next 21 days. So I don't know if that affects how you want to schedule, because at some point you're going to have to have, I can't imagine doing two new RDAs. And, the, you know, you don't have to do those mix at, on the 25th, but you would have to do them the next week, I think. I'd have to count days. Um, yeah, so I, I was trying to avoid a meeting every week, but uh, we'll I know <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, you know, maybe do you want to? It, yeah, you're going to have to have two meetings in the near within the next three weeks. Let's put it that way. So I guess the question is, do you want to have, you know, a meeting next week and then on the 25th or do you want to have a meeting on the 25th and then the following week? Um, next week is re like really tight for me i'm sorry um no that's fine i like i said i just i just wanted to you know have yeah that i, I think yeah i think we'll we'll have to deal with one afterwards and i'm sorry commissioners but maybe we'll have to do the week after the 25th whatever that date is i can't see my calendar it's, maybe it's, the first the first yeah um but I, i'm would, not available on the first but if the other three are then you still have a quorum Okay, Sean, Ben. Uh, shouldn't be an issue, but if we do spill over, I will be gone the eighth. Okay. I'm okay. Sean on the first. I'm okay. Available. All right. 
so let me see what we can do then and um because i do think we need to take the, the next week it's just a chunky week for me um but to take the time to get this right and to get this one done concentrate <laughs> on the, the sunny days noi and then uh we'll, we'll move forward and open up the next ones and see where we go <laughs> Okay. Um, Pete, um, we, um, Pete, we want to, so the fact that we'll finalize this and, and the order of conditions, especially, um, that helps John Furman and I actually, um, if we were to get approved at that next meeting and everyone is ingredients, um, that would give John Furman and I a clear path to go to mass DOT and, and, and move forward, um, as quickly as possible um, before yeah. the summer, before we lose the summer. So okay. I'm I'm, fi I'm fine with that, Pete. And as soon as you can get those to us, our team yep. will review review that and and be prepared for that next meeting. Yeah, I um, yeah, um, I got to be out early tomorrow morning. Um, but Amy and I will work on it tomorrow, or and, and somebody if it's not Friday, I'll be over the weekend. I'll get it out to you. Um, take a look. Um. And then, um, oh, just one other request, and this is kind of off to the side, but um, one of the things that we're working on with, with some of the um, projects that we're doing now is educational signage uh, for the public when they come in and looking at why a wetland's here and what's here and then so forth. And this is like kind of a special wetlands area. Um, so for an educational thing, I didn't know we can talk about it on the side if you might be interested in in doing some of that it would be combined with the Deerfield Conservation Commission and your and your company and you know about explaining what it is what we do how it is and how how great everybody is out there and what you did all that kind of stuff yeah so, so anyways we'll take it up to the side yeah so that's fine i think um we'll definitely work with you i mean you know it's a basically a sign that we're putting up and and that's made by somebody with in, in, information on it correct about the wetlands. yeah yeah we'll we'll do all the design all that kind of stuff we're we're doing some over at, across the street at treehouse coming up here pretty soon too so yeah it's yeah just, that's just that's, different that's things fun. to try to you know alert people and it's also i think good just great publicity for you guys you know, yeah that that's fine too. i think this is a great site for that um yeah. there'll be a lot of stuff in there and, and and we're trying to you know make some habitat for wildlife along along with our right. plans so i think that's great pete we'll we'll work with you for sure yeah no problem we'll, we'll, i'll call you up on the side on that one but just by just my last note here before we go so i think uh it would take a motion then to continue the hearing um until may 25th and I believe we might do that at six o'clock okay. versus yeah. six thirty. We're trying to get earlier and earlier because, <laughs> yeah, these meetings I'm go on that and on. Down six five okay. twenty-five at six. <laughs> so I think everybody's okay with continuing the hearing to the twenty-fifth. I will get out all the information between Amy and I, um, and then I really would appreciate, you know, some some feedback back and forth pretty quickly. So. By the time we come to the 25th, um, we might have just a 10 minute discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I, I move we continue the hearing for the notice of intent filed by Ken Buquellen of Sunny Days uh, for the construction of a cannabis campus uh, proposed for Zero Green Field Road, map 159, lot 14, to the next scheduled meeting, May 25th at 6 p.m. Okay. Kate Devil, second. Okay, there's a motion second on the on the floor. Any uh, other comments from the commissioners on the motion? Okay, hearing none, I'll take a roll roll call vote. Kate, Devlin, aye. Sean Libby, Sean Libby, aye. Ben Byrne, Ben Byrne, aye. Uh, Pete Law, aye. So the motion passes and we'll take it up again in uh, 14 days and we'll have a lot of back and forth in the meantime and get things straight. Thank you. Appreciate it so much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your commissioners, time. Commissioners got just a couple more things on the agenda. Okay. Thanks, right. everybody. Okay. Right. Um, so general discussion, anybody have anything else for general discussion? items note okay um i did hear oh. back from um um 
Damien at Treehouse. I'm going to send him a letter. Um, it's half written here um, about letting, uh, you know, taking out the erosion control stuff that's over there. And he's also, he just said to, you know, to me, it's like, uh, just tell me what you want the signs. We've got the design area. We can do it all. And let us know and just tell us what to do. So he's uh, up and ready to do it and do it all on our own. So that could be good. Um, Tim, I might talk to you on the on the side because we're we're looking at these educational signage, and I think there's some other committees or whatever in town doing it on you know trails and parkland. I don't know if uh, the select board would like to keep everything consistent, look and feel, and so forth and so on. Um, but um, I'll, I'll I'll ping you tomorrow on that or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was no new mail. Uh, nothing. Uh, <laughs> Nothing you know, unanticipated in the last 48 hours that we didn't talk about tonight. So um, next meeting would be on May 25 at 6 p.m. And if there's no other comments, I would take a, a motion to adjourn. Can I just take 15 seconds to say thank you to everyone? Because yeah. you guys are doing a great job. I know you've been working really hard. You've been inundated with things. Select board really appreciates it. and. Um, we're hopeful that uh, we can fill out your ranks before your next meeting, although she, this person wouldn't be able to participate in the discussions on the NOI, but with the RDAs would be up and running, former planning board person. So somebody who's familiar with the process. And, uh, but anyway, you, you guys have been great. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah, I greatly, greatly appreciate it, Tim. This, uh, this group is, been working hard the last year. Never worked been... and underpaid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, but appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, good night, all. All right. Good and night. we can uh, take the motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn uh, at 8.36 p.m. Second. <laughs> Second. Okay. <laughs> take a roll call, Sean. Aye. Ben. Ben Byrne, aye. Kate. Kate Devlin, aye. All right. Uh, Pete Law, aye. We are adjourned.